Hello viewers, today we are going to look into a very famous essay by William Hazlitt. We have many a times in our life come across people who are skillful and those who are talented. Now looking into the essay of William Hazlitt, we'll come to know about the difference between being skillful, talented and great. William Hazlitt has very beautifully described what is greatness, taking the example of the rope dancer and the Indian juggler in this beautiful essay. Well, our objective would be to comprehend professional and biological profile of William Hazlitt. To understand the definitions of different skills, talent and greatness by Hazlitt and to learn the theme of the Indian juggler. Well, let's have a brief look into the summary of this essay. The Indian juggler. It is one of the famous essays by William Hazlitt and in this essay he defines mechanical dexterity of an Indian juggler and the rope dancer. He explains how these skills are dissimilar to the talents of a painter or an artist. He felt that he not only had wasted his valuable time without learning any mechanical skill, but also had the feeling of the inefficacy and slow progress of intellectual excellence as compared to the mechanical excellence. Hazlitt also defines three kinds of exceptional abilities that is cleverness, talent and genius. And he is concerned chiefly with genius in his essay The Indian Juggler. Cleverness, he says, is a certain knack or aptitude for doing certain things in an offhand manner. Talent is the capacity to do anything that depends on application and industry. But talent differs from genius. He thinks ingenious is genius in trifle. But greatness is genius in undertakings of much substance and importance. William Hazlitt was one of the leading prose writers of the Romantic period. He was an essayist, a literary critic and a social commentator, a biographer and a philosopher. He was also a painter. His writings are characterized by conversational diction and personal opinion on every topic. William Hazlitt was born in 1798. His father was a dissenting minister and hoped that his son would be paternal successor of his profession. But the boy showed little inclination for that vocation. In 1793, Hazlitt was admitted as a student to the Hackney Theological College and then got an acquaintance with free-thinking men and began to feel personally interested in the art of painting. After joining at the Hackney College, he returned to Wen, where Hazlitt spent few years reading, painting, walking and struggling to express himself in words a period of apprenticeship as a budding painter. He even worked as a travelling portrait painter. Hazlitt extremely admires Coleridge and William Wordsworth, but Coleridge is the one who stimulated his interest in liberation and philosophy. Hazlitt met Coleridge in 1798 and that was a landmark in his life. His initial publications of his books were not much successful. Later, he wrote articles 
on various subjects from parliamentary debates to dramatic and operatic criticism that made him popular. In 1812, he delivered 10 lectures on lectures on English philosophy at the Russell Institution on Philosophy and during 1819 and 1820, a number of his lectures that were given in Surrey Institution on different topics were published in book form. Hazlitt's best works were the two volumes of The Table Talk, Round Table and The Plain Speaker. They are a collection of essays and are hard to match for variety of subject, brilliance of style and valid criticism of life and letters. In August 1830, Hazlitt fell seriously ill because of his ill habits of drinking and suffered from indigestion. He broke financially and had to stay with his son. The disease aggravated and he took his last breath on 18 September 1830. He is reported to have said that, well, I have had a happy life just before his death. William Hazlitt's most important works are often divided into two categories, literary criticism and familiar essays. Hazlitt always deals with the enormous variety of subjects and themes, literary subjects, subjects relating to the theatre, subjects relating to the art of painting, and an amazing variety of miscellaneous subjects. He shows a vast knowledge of human nature in his essays. He was not only a philosopher but a psychiatrist who understood the workings of human mind. He could analyze human motives. His essays are full of generalization about human life and human nature. He introduces a concept of gusto, a term he used to refer to qualities of passion and energy that he considered necessary to a great art. He felt that Shakespeare's sonnets lacked gusto and judged them as passionless. He was no less opinionated on the works of his contemporaries. The many and varied familiar essays that Hazlitt wrote for magazine publication and collected them in the volumes of The Round Table, Table Talk and The Plain Speaker. These are usually considered his finest works. Hazlitt makes use of the faculty of imagination for critical purpose after Coleridge. He was Coleridge's linear successor in literary criticism. At the age of 38, Hazlitt returned to critics with a study entitled Characters of Shakespeare Plays, in which he attempted to vindicate the characters of Shakespeare's plays from the stigma of French criticism. Hazlitt's style of writing poetry in Hazlitt's terminology, it is said that his style is characterized by a purity of expression. The phrase purity of expression implies rejection of archaisms, cant words, vulgarisms and eccentric writing. His writings in a chaste style which is both expressive and elevated. Hazlitt makes use only of the most appropriate words and puts them into excellent combinations, constructing sentences which are grammatically accurate and which are 
perfect from the point of view of syntax. The greatest thing about Hazlitt is that his choice of words is judicious and he writes with the utmost care. No great author has ever written anything important or significant without a use of the figures of speech. Similes, metaphors, antithesis, etc. are the common devices employed by the writer. Hazlitt generally employs figures of speech either to elucidate his meaning or to emphasize it so that these figures of speech become integral to the style. Allusiveness and quotations are other features of Hazlitt's style. The use of these devices enriches the style. Every essay by Hazlitt contains a number of allusions which are mostly literary but sometimes biblical, historical or mythological. His major works include a number of essays. In 1817 appeared a collection of essays entitled The Round Table, including his review of Wordsworth's Excursion and in 1818 a collection of his dramatic reviews a view of the English stage and the eight lectures on the English poets which proved to be a synoptic view of the major poets from Chaucer to the contemporary scene. The spirit of the age contains essays on writers of the previous half century made its appearance. In 1826, the plain speaker, the notes of journey. Being an ardent fan of Napoleon, he wrote and published a book on Napoleon in the year 1826, namely The Life of Napoleon. On conjugal front, through lamps, he met Sarah Stoddart, whom he married in the year 1808. After a divorce from his wife, Hazlitt entered into a second unsuccessful marriage with a rich widow. An Indian juggler begins his performance with tossing up two brass balls and ends it with four balls. Anybody can keep two balls, but keeping four balls successfully and successively needs utmost stretch of human ingenuity. The bending of the faculties of the body and mind to do it from childhood with incessant ever anxious application up to manhood can accomplish and even make slight approach to. The juggler performs this skill with lightning rapidity and mathematical precision. On one occasion, Hazlitt had witnessed a famous rope dancer giving his performance at Sadler's Wells. Hazlitt had found this man to be matchless in this art. This man, whose name was Richer, had shown extraordinary skill and had performed the dance on a rope with great ease and with much grace. In those days, Hazlitt had been employed in copying a half-length picture painted by Sir Joshua Reynolds and after seeing Richard's performance, he had begun to feel ashamed of his own lack of skill. He had found that the work which he was doing was clumsy and defective as compared to the rope dancer's performance. He felt that he not only had wasted his valuable time without learning any mechanical skill but had also the feeling of inefficacy and 
slow progress of intellectual excellence as compared to mechanical excellence. Hazlitt then expresses the view that in mechanical efforts a man improves by perpetual practice and that a man can surely go on improving because the object is to be attained is not a matter of taste or fancy or opinion but of actual experiment in which a man can do a thing or not do it. The distinction between the true and the false, right and the wrong is tangible and obvious. There is no scope of self-deception in such cases. In this sort of manual dexterity, firstly a gradual aptitude acquired from constant repetition and secondly an exact knowledge of how much is still wanting and necessary to be supplied. Furthermore, what is meant by perfection in mechanical exercise is the capacity to perform certain feats of a uniform nicety. At the same time, there is a limit to the skill which one can acquire in any mechanical exercise. He can perfectly perform this act with only four balls, but even one extra ball would fail him miserably. Hazlitt believes that the artist's task is more difficult than that of the juggler who aims at the mechanical perfection. An artist undertakes either to imitate another artist who is superior to himself or he undertakes to do what nature has done. It is for this reason that Hazlitt feels a greater respect for the artist Sir Joshua Reynolds than for the juggler or for the rope dancer whose name was Richard. There have been more people in the world who could dance on a rope like Richard than those who could paint like Sir Joshua Reynolds. You can put a child as an apprentice to a rope dancer with some confidence that the child would one day grow up to become a successful rope dancer. But the same cannot be done in the field of painting or writing poetry. Here only one out of a million children would likely to gain any proficiency. Objects like words have a meaning and the true artist is the interpreter of the language of nature. However, the artist can interpret the language only by knowing its application to a thousand other objects in a thousand other situations. But the unraveling of this mysterious web of thought and feeling is possible only for the painter or the poet who has the power of that trembling sensibility which is awake to every change and every modification of its every ever varying expressions and impressions. This power is called genius or imagination or feeling or taste. But the manner this power acts upon the mind can neither be defined by abstract rules as is the case in science nor verified by continual unvarying experiments as in the case of mechanical performances. Talent is the capacity to do anything that depends on application and industry such as writing a criticism, making a speech and studying the law. But talent differs from genius. Ingenuity is genius in trifle, but 
Greatness is genius in undertakings of much substance and importance. An ingenious or clever man is one who can do anything well, whether it is worth doing or not. But a great man is one who chooses or does of the highest importance. Themistocles said that he could not play flute, but could change a small city into a great one. This cleverly exemplifies the difference between an ingenious man and a great man. A flute player is an ingenious one, but a man who builds a city is a man of genius. Hazlitt defines greatness as great power producing great effects. It is not enough that a man should have great power in himself. He must be able to show his power to the entire world in a way which cannot be hidden or denied. A great man must achieve great results through the exercise of his great inherent energy. Besides, a man is not truly great if he is great only in his lifetime. The test of greatness is the page of history. What is short-lived must be of a gross and vulgar nature. A Lord Mayor is hardly a great man. A city orator or a patriot of the day is very far from any true ambition because each of them can reach the height of his desire. Popularity is neither fame nor greatness. A king is not a great man because although he has great power, this power is not his own. He merely wields the level of the state. A mathematician who solves a profound problem or a poet who creates an image of beauty which was not there previously in anybody's mind imparts knowledge and power to others. And here lies his greatness and foundation of his fame. Shakespeare, Bacon, Newton, Milton, Cromwell were great men because they showed great power by their deeds and thoughts which have not been forgotten. A chess player with exceptional skills is not a great man because he leaves the world just as he found it. An exceptional example of manual dexterity, says Hazlitt, was a man called John Kavana, who died on the 7th February in the year 1819. This man used to play the game of five to perfection and when he died, he did not leave anyone behind him to equal his achievement in that field. Some people may say that there are things in this world of greater importance than playing the game of fives, which simply involves striking a ball against a wall. A really great man has always had an idea of something greater than himself. A rich man is not a great man except to his dependents and his servants. Hazlitt says that John Davis, a tennis player, was as much skillful as John Kavana and Powell. But in spite of their skill, these people gain no immortality. This means that manual dexterity, even of the most excellent degree, is inferior to any intellectual achievement of a high order.
critics argue that the title of this essay is in fact a misnomer which I have already mentioned. The most part of the essay deals with the contrast between a mechanical performer and a practitioner of one or the other fine arts such as painting or writing poetry. The essay is very entertaining and it begins with a brief description of the skills of an Indian juggler and ends with a long account of the manual dexterity and the character. Both the initial description and the concluding account are highly entertaining but the central idea of the essay is the nature of greatness and the attribute of a great man. We can appreciate thesis put forward by Hazlitt, but his analysis between the two kinds of theories are not really acknowledged. Though Hazlitt's definition of greatness and illustration of greatness are lucid and clear, one may not accept his abstract reasoning of the analysis. It is noteworthy aspect of Hazlitt's thought in this essay that he does not speak at all of mechanical ingenuity in any disparaging terms. On the contrary, the essay begins with an almost ecstatic description of an Indian jugglers and later of a rope dancer's achievement in performing certain feats which represent the highest reach of ingenuity and application. But he does acknowledge the fact that this kind of excellence or perfection is inferior to intellectual and artistic excellence. Hazlitt's conception of greatness is great results spring from great inherent energy and Hazlitt explains his conception with wealth illustrations. As is usual with Hazlitt, this essay is pervaded, imbued and saturated with personal references, with anecdotes and with reminiscences. The style, as always in his essays, is scholarly yet lucid, but this essay is written in a somewhat rambling manner, though the main ideas have been stated clearly and in a logical manner. The structure of this essay is not as well knit as that of some other essays by William Hazlitt. Well, after going through the various aspects of William Hazlitt's essay, the Indian juggler, we have understood the real meaning of being skillful and being great and why some people are known to be great and their greatness surpasses time. So this essay has actually enlightened us on this important aspect of our life. Thank you.